trust forever in your name, the name of Jesus. We trust the name of Jesus. You are the only King forever. Almighty God. Jesus Christ has broken every chain. 
say. Come on, church. what he did for us, how he lived. And I just love how this is why he came, to break every chain, to set us free so that those who are blind could see again, those who are lost would be found. And he even said right here in Luke chapter five, he stood up in front of the synagogue and he opened the book to Isaiah and he began to read and he said this, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. That is why he came. The spirit of the Lord that was in him is here with us today. And his heart's desire is to do the same thing, that we would know that every chain has been broken, that we who are blind can see those who are lost, we found this morning here with him. And as we sing this next song, it starts with that old hymn, Amazing Grace. And I wanna encourage you and remind you that as we sing, that sound is as sweet today as it has ever been. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. It saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see my chains are gone. Amen. Let's sing that together.
Praise God, 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 praise God. take just a moment right now, just you, and uh, think about what you have to give thanks for. You close your eyes, keep them open, it doesn't matter, but just tell God, just take a moment, just tell God what you're thankful for, express it in your own words this morning. Father, we're so grateful that we can come and you invite us to come and to gather in the mighty name of Jesus, and as we do, to lift our voices up and to call upon your name because you hear and answer prayer. And your word tells us that you show us great and mighty things we have not yet seen. So hope is restored in your presence. And we lift up prayer requests today for health and for finances, financial needs within families. And Lord, we see your word says that you are the Lord who heals and that by the stripes of Jesus we've been healed. So we thank you for your healing power at work within your resurrection life that lives and abides within. And Father, that you're a God who provides, who protects and cares for us. So Father, we believe for financial uh, needs to be met, for full-time jobs for all, Father. We believe that you provide for every household. Father, help us to be diligent as we serve you to do all things that's not just to man, but to you. And Lord, to see your favor upon each one. And we give you thanks, Father, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Uh, we also want to extend our condolences to uh, Lorena Kipfer and her family. Uh, Wayne passed away very suddenly this week. And uh, visitation continues this afternoon, this evening. If you want more information, you can do that, get that from the Resource Center. But the uh, funeral will be here tomorrow at 11 o'clock. And uh, we want to pray for them, lift them up. A lot of extended family have gathered together as well. Father, we just lift up uh, Loretta and, and her children, extended family. Father, believe that, uh, Lord, you who are the God of all comfort, uh, you comfort them in this place and in this time, and you undergird and strengthen them. Father, you call us to comfort others as even we have been comforted, Father, that we may identify and, and empathize, Father, with those around us in need of your peace in a new and profound way. We ask for fresh grace to be upon them for this season, that you lift and you care for them. Father, that you hold them in the palm of your hand. And Father, we are grateful for the life that uh, Wayne lived among us and the people he touched. We're grateful, Father, that as we uh, celebrate, we celebrate the fact that he is with you. But Lord, we thank you that you are the God who comforts us in our loss. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, God tells us to bring the, the small and the large before him because he hears and he answers prayer. And uh, there's, a, there's a praise report today that somebody had been very, very sick and uh, had a real turnaround in the health. And the doctors uh, don't have an explanation for it, but they're giving praise to God. I believe God's been at work. And so they're rejoicing as he's come home from the hospital. And uh, we rejoice with them today. Amen. Amen. I invite you to go take your seat if you would this morning. I want to welcome everyone here this morning. If you're live streaming with us, we're glad that you could join us here. If you're a guest with us this morning at Koinea, we invite you to take one of our Connect cards. Uh, and if you fill that out, take that into the Welcome Center after. We'd love to meet you in the foyer, have some refreshments. We have a gift for you as well. And uh, if you have a prayer request, praise report, that's what these Connect cards are for. You can uh, fill them in, hand them in to someone on the way out or the resource center. And uh, we would uh, love to have you be a part of that and so we can get to know you a little bit better. Heidi uh, Fleming is going to be sharing a, a second message in the Love Reaches series today. We're excited about that. And uh, right now, we're going to celebrate water baptism together.
Yes, good morning. Matthew 28 reminds us the great mandate of the church to go into the world and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything he's commanded. And I want you to notice I'm in the tank. I want you to notice I'm wearing a shirt that says, I'm in. But how many know that the shirt, the message I'm in is not so much about, well, I'm in the tank. It's about the powerful truth and reality that those of us who have confessed Christ as Lord, we're in Christ. Paul uses that term extensively in his writings. One of the keynote verses is in 2 Corinthians 5.17, which says, if anyone is in Christ, I'm in. I'm in say, I'm in Christ. I'm in Christ. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Notice, new creation, not just a new model, not just an upgrade, not version 2.0, a totally new creation. And there's two sides to this now. It's because the old sin nature has passed away, has died. We're dead to sin, and all things have become new. Resurrection life, we're raised to new life. And that's what this tank that we're in right now represents. Both sides of it are, are important that... Uh, we, Christ died on the cross. We, uh, sin, our sin nature died with him. So we, uh, this symbolizes death and burial. And then, but the coming out is the powerful side to this. And I want you to think, uh, they're, they're raised to new life because that's what we live out of as believers, as new creations. And I want you to think of the state of this tank. I never thought of this before. I was sitting last Sunday, just thinking about the tank. How does it sit most of the time? And well, how will it be after we get out this morning? It's empty. And as we approach Easter, what is, what is the powerful truth? What's empty? The tomb's empty. So God has given us a, this thing of baptism, and the, the tank is empty. After You know, see, that's the message, the, the resurrection life. Now, there's five that are coming this morning that very clearly and decisively have said, yes, I have decided to follow Jesus. And they are obeying him in this act of water baptism, identifying their faith that they're dead to the old sin nature and alive and raised to new life. Let's just pray before they come. Father, thank you for these powerful truths that it is because of you that we are in Christ. You have joined us to Christ's body. And we are, uh, as each of these come, I thank you as they identify that their old sin nature is dead and they're raised up out of the water that they are raised up in newness of life and they're either even further realize their the new creation reality that they live out of this resurrection life that you've put in them and in each one of us that confess you as lord bless them as they come we pray in jesus name amen all right first up we have asatia the first three are all Siblings from the same family, it's kind of cool. Starting with the oldest, Asatia. Asatia, have you received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes, I have. Can you tell us why you want to be baptized? God has chosen me to be a part of this world. He has given me a purpose, and ever since I've moved from South Africa, I have been learning and growing in Christ. One of the most important messages God has taught me is to obey. So today I've decided to obey him and be baptized as a public declaration of my faith in Christ. Amen. <clears throat> Say, Satia, upon confession of your faith in the name of the Lord Jesus, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Next, we have Caprice. Priest, have you received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes, I have. Can you tell us why you want to be baptized? Because I want to become a new and better person, and I want to have a strong relationship with God, and I also want to obey Him. Like the Bible says, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have Good commanded verse. you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Matthew 28, verse 19 to 20. And I want to be an example of this. (laughs) 
Caprice, upon confession of your faith in the name of the Lord Jesus, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And next is Isaac. Isaac, have you received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes, I have. And can you tell us why you want to be baptized? I always loved to read the Bible with my mom and dad. I always been entrusted in the Word of God. I always loved the stories in the Bible. I, I like to see people being baptized just like Jesus, and I want to, to be baptized too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Isaac, upon confession of your faith in the name of the Lord Jesus, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Next is Catherine. Catherine, have you received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes. Can you tell us why you want to be baptized? I want to be baptized because I love Jesus and I want to obey his examples and I want to follow his directions where I go. Amen. <laughs> Catherine, upon confession of your faith in the name of the Lord Jesus, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And Danny. <clears throat> Danny, have you received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes. Can you tell us why you want to be baptized? I had something prepared, but I think I'm just going to speak from the heart. Um, I've been broken for quite some time, I've been confused walking in vanity and I'm done with that I want to I want the truth and the truth is the truth as long as I follow Jesus Christ I'll be good Amen. Amen. Danny, upon confession of your faith in the name of the Lord Jesus, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Jesus is the truth. As long as you keep following the truth, it's going to be good. It's going to work out. You know, obedience, I'm going to mention obedience comes from hearing and responding in obedience to the voice of God. It's not simply words on the page. The words on the page are what's been recorded are the words of Jesus. But when you hear Jesus speak to you, your heart wants to respond with obedience. If any of you are Christ followers, you've not yet been water baptized, I want to encourage you um, to not delay any longer. Just step up and sign up and, and the next baptism you can be a part of it. It's just an important thing to respond to the, to the voice of God calling us to uh, understand that there's something that's taking place. It's not, it's not just for us to observe. It's something's taking place in these individuals as they obey the words of Jesus um, to be baptized. And as one of the young ladies said, his example. And uh, amen, amen. But we're going to worship with our tithes and offerings right now. And if you've already given online or at the kiosk, we want to thank you for that. But Luke chapter 12, verse uh, 34, Jesus said, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And the context of this is uh, people who are worrying about what they were going to eat, drink, and wear, and uh, get caught up with that. And uh, 
one is the striving for and the other is holding on to. And uh, he, was, he was trying to help them understand if you seek the kingdom of God, that God, the Father, who knows what you have need of, will add these things to us. And he's telling us not to hold on more than we should or pursue more than we ought to with our heart as if we could be our own source. And uh, where, what we do with our resources and our finances it very much demonstrates where our heart is at. And that's what Jesus was saying. And then he's calling us and he's saying, you know, if you will deposit, make some deposits into the treasures of heaven. If you, would, if you sow into what is eternal, and that is the lives of people changed and transformed by the power of God. If you, if you give into the work of the kingdom of God, he says, you're going to give to something that will last for eternity. Treasures in heaven where no one can steal it and where moths can't destroy it. As we give today, uh, we give with our heart, from our heart realizing that he is the one that we serve. We have everything that we have, we owe to him. And it's our privilege to be a part of reaching out with the arms of the kingdom to others who do not know his life or his love. Father, we just thank you right now. As we come, we are grateful. We bring our tithes and our offerings and our hearts that are grateful for all that you've done and all that you've given. And Father, we ask that you'd use them for the furthering of your kingdom. And we thank you that you provide seed for the sower bread to the eater. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. We believe we are most like Jesus when we serve. Every month, over 40 teams and almost 500 volunteers serve our church family and our community. Whether it's greeting people as they drive into our parking lot, teaching children to love God's word, or serving on our production or outreach teams, there really is nothing as rewarding as using our God-given gifts to serve others. We just want to say thank you. Thank you so much for everything that you do here. When you serve, you represent the heart of Jesus. That was Laura Barnes. She's our volunteer champion. She's on staff, helps people uh, find the place where they fit and how to use their gifts and serve uh, in the house, and so we're excited. Along with uh, other leaders and uh, department heads, uh, we are planning to say thank you to all you, our volunteers. If you volunteer in any area, we invite you to come on Saturday evening at uh, 6.30. It's gonna be 6.30 to 9. We've got a special, um, we gotta, we got to have a special uh, guest, uh, comedian and entertainer, Bob Cates is gonna be with us. It's gonna be a fun night. Uh, please RSVP at the, either the resource center or kcf.org slash volunteer, but we hope you uh, make a point of being with us. It's going to be a great night. On Tuesday evening, I want to speak to all the Covenant Partners. Uh, we have a Covenant Partners semi-annual meeting Tuesday, March 20th. Time to share with what's some elements of the vision and what's God doing, saying to us as we move forward. Uh, there's also an opportunity, if you've never been to a Seder Passover meal, uh, Jeremy Dorton is going to be hosting one here on Tuesday, March 27th at 6 p.m., and that's a Passover meal, uh, a Jewish meal. Uh, it's a teaching meal. So it's not just going for dinner. It's a, it's a teaching time to understand uh, what takes place around Passover and all this uh, symbolism that's involved in the supper. Um, also, divine missions trip uh, for the ladies uh, coming up in April, April 19th to 22nd, going to the Dream Center in Buffalo, New York, some inner center ministry opportunities. Uh, you can visit the kiosk in the foyer after to pick up an application package or download it online. And uh, also some of the details for these announcements are found on your uh, news card. If you check that out, it has all the details concerning these announcements. Uh, if you stand with me, we're going to dismiss Kingdom Kids and Impact 78 as well. And if your kids are not uh, um, signed in yet then we want to invite you to uh, do that on the way to class and let's continue to worship together.
are my God. Faithfulness, my solid rock. Come, let's sing it out. today that as we come to your word we know that it is alive and powerful so holy spirit would you be here with us present would you breathe on your word would you speak to our hearts would you change and transform us from the inside out in jesus name we are ready in jesus name amen amen before you sit down i'm gonna have you do something uh today my title is love crosses the line gonna explain what that means but as you can see out there in the auditorium we're sitting in rows you know there's that nice little cracked line in those chairs we like that don't we it's like I feel safe here this is my little piece of real estate at church this morning <laughs> this is my chair <laughs> you know we like that space we like the security of that uh, row in front of us like oh yeah 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 I'm good I got my my walls <laughs> But I'm gonna encourage you to do something. As we talk about how love crosses the line, I encourage you to reach across the line and meet somebody today. Say hello, give a high five, whatever is your, your style, whatever you do, that's all good. Just reach across those lines. Go ahead before you're seated today. good. It's good to remember that those lines are just, they don't need to be there. They just are. But we can remember to reach across those lines. It's good. Thank you for participating in that. Even if you are not so enthused. Sometimes, you know, sometimes I'm like, really? Are we doing this? But thank you. Because it is good to remember that we, we, we're here together. We're here together. And this is a safe place for us to be in to reach. Reach. Love reaches. Be in to reach across those lines. Before I get too far today, I just want to talk a little bit about our, our, our ministry that's going to be launching next week for families who have children with special needs. And I'm really excited about what God's going to do. Just believing in faith that God's going to bring some people among us who we can support and love on and say, you belong here. 
And uh, so next Sunday morning, our uh, sensory room will be open. This is going to be a space for kids who um, it's more difficult for them to be included in a regular, typical setting. Um, And so we want to make it available for parents to say, this is going to be great for me to be able to actually come to church and be able to have a safe place to drop my kids off. And also for, for our kids to feel like, yes, this is a place where I can come and I can do my thing and learn. It's good. So that's going to happen. It's going to be open just for the 9 a.m. service to start. Um, just going to help us start rolling out with this thing, this type of thing. And hopefully as it grows, we can expand. But just so you know, it will be open at the 9 a.m. service. So if you know someone um, who has trouble coming to church because of having a child with special needs, we would love to know. We'd love to meet them. Encourage you to invite them out next Sunday. As well, we're going to have buddies available. So this is one-to-one support in our typical classrooms. And I know there's lots of kids out there who could use a buddy. And so if you know someone in the, with a, a child with special needs that could use that, that's going to be available. And we'll have people ready next week as well. So excited for what God's going to do. And as well, we do, I want to mention, we do have a support group that meets for families who have kids with special needs. And so if you're interested in learning more about that, I'd love to connect you with some people. Um, you can send me an email at koinoniakids at kcf.org, and I'd love to connect you. So I'm excited about what God's going to do as we begin to open up that opportunity and that ministry, and I know that it's needed, and I know that I'm trusting that thank you to those who have responded to say, I'll help, (laughs) you know, it's going to be great, and I'm excited for that. This morning we have a story for you, a video story of one of our families, so enjoy. This is the Dawson family. got married in 2006 and pretty much right away we started trying to have babies. Um, We realized shortly into it that um, we were going to have some struggles so we ended up doing IVF towards the end and uh, we found out we were pregnant with Addison. I was more it was more apprehensive like holy smokes I'm gonna be a dad. That was very nerve-wracking for me but until it got down to the brass tacks and then it was well it's go time let's now we're excited i'm excited we went in to be induced but um, i was induced for almost well a day and a half it was a full day and a half and nothing was happening as a mom i knew something was wrong i knew something wasn't right we ended up having to go in for a c-section because she wasn't dropping and nothing was happening it's not uh, ideal when you know, they lift your kid out and the kid doesn't say anything, doesn't make any noise. And a lifeless body is lifted over to a group of eight or nine nurses. Well, I didn't know what had happened. Um, all I knew was that there was something wrong. She was hooked up with CPAP machine, and tubes, and you name it. She had everything hooked up to her. So. Mark had went and saw her and came back with a video of her, and I knew instantly that she had this genetic syndrome that's that's in my family. The first, I'd say 12 hours, were really hard. They were really hard for us. Um, I felt selfish about the whole situation, that we waited so long to have a child, and we had a child with special needs. And uh, we were both up in the middle of the night just crying, like, what do we do? Like, what do we do? How do we do this? And a nurse came in and saw us, and she said, do you want to go see her? And we went and saw her, and I know for me, my thoughts changed instantly when I saw her because she only had us. So the beginning stages were hard. They were definitely hard. I mean, it still continues to be difficult at times, but we had to teach her how to hold things. We had to to teach her how to eat. We had to teach her how to drink from a bottle. Um, You know, all those little things that babies just automatically do, we had to teach her all those things. Just certain things we have to be more aware of than others, but day to day, Day to day, she's just a kid. I mean, she's got some special needs, but she's just a kid. 
she she looks at herself that way and we kind of look at her as look at her that way too she's she's our kid i think god has really taught me patience <laughs> he's still teaching me that i think <laughs> he hasn't really nailed it with me just quite yet addison takes so long to get through those milestones that you almost get a chance to kind of embrace them and while you're in them some of those things they just they get to linger and you get to almost enjoy them a little bit longer i love watching her meeting new people she loves to meet new people and she doesn't see race she doesn't see um you know color she doesn't she just doesn't see any of those things any any sort of disability she doesn't see that she just loves everybody she wants to love everybody so it's really refreshing to see and it's a nice reminder that you know you, you should take people for who they are and not what you see on the outside she she's going to be all right she's going to adapt and she's going to be perfectly fine We don't know what the future's going to hold. I mean, we're just going day by day, and we just continue loving her and watching her grow and change and become this perfect little human being. Because she is. She's perfect. She's perfectly Addison. <laughs>
Love doesn't just say, I'm going to stay here and you stay over there. Love says, how can I reach? How can I cross the line? And so the first line, so Jesus, what's interesting is he's, as I was reading earlier about how he stood up in the synagogue and he gives that whole message about I'm here to heal the brokenhearted. I'm here, here to set the captives free. And so he stands up and he says that. And right after that, they drive him out of the church and they are rejecting him. And instead of getting down and frustrated, he continues on his purpose. He continues. And the first thing he does is he goes out and he's at the lake of Gennesaret and he sees two boats standing by the lake and he gets in one of the boats. And there's a whole multitude of crowds standing out there and Jesus gets in the boat and they push off a little ways and he begins to teach people out of the boat. And so this multitude is standing there watching. So they're teaching people out of the boat and, and then he gets in the boat of Simon Peter. He picks one boat and it happens to be the boat of Simon Peter, this fisherman. And all night long, these fishermen have been putting down the nets and bringing them in. They haven't been catching anything. And what is going on? This is their job. You know, you got one job. Catch the fish. And they're not catching anything. And so Jesus says, he's finished preaching, and he says, let down the nets and, and bring them in. And, they, and Peter says, okay, <laughs> you know, we've been doing this all night, and we haven't caught anything. Nevertheless, at your word, because you say, We'll let down the nets. So they let down those nets, and the nets are full of fish, like to the point where they're like calling over other people. They're like, can you please come and help us? Our nets are breaking. They're pulling all of these fish into the boats, so much so the, the, the Bible says the, the boats are beginning to sink. They're like so heavy with fish at this point. So you could say this is a miracle, okay? Jesus has just performed a miracle in their midst in Simon Peter's boat, and he witnesses it firsthand. Whoa, what is going on? And you know what is so interesting is that Peter draws a line. And he says in verse 8, When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish which they had taken. I'm a sinful man. Somehow, in this moment, Peter has witnessed this miracle and he has decided we are not, we do not belong in the same boat. He has drawn a line. He has said, listen, you are out of my league. <laughs> I don't know if you know, but you really shouldn't be in this boat, actually. You should get out of the boat because I am not worthy for you to be in this boat with me. Peter draws his own line out of his own uh, feeling unqualified, feeling unworthy, feeling his insecurity. Jesus, you don't know the thoughts I've thought. You don't know the things I've done. I'm a sinful man, and you should not be in this boat. And he's ready to draw that line like, whoa, <laughs> what has just happened here? But love crosses the line, crosses the lines I draw for myself. That I say, Jesus, you belong there and I am here. But Jesus, he specifically picks that boat and he got, he got in it. And Jesus, basically in here it says, Jesus said to Simon Peter, do not be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. And what he's really saying is, Peter, you're trying to draw the line to say, this is my identity. This is who I am. I am a sinful man and you do not belong in my group. <laughs> Because you are clearly on another level. And Jesus says, don't be afraid. In fact, I've chosen this boat for a reason, Simon Peter. In fact, not only have I chosen this boat, I'm inviting you to join me. I do not disqualify you, Simon Peter. I do not write you off. I do not just say, oh, too sinful for me to associate with. No, in fact, I'm inviting you to be part of what I'm about to do. The big plan and big mission that I have, you get to be part of it. And I want you to walk with me. And I want you to be close to me. And I'm going to cross that line. You want to draw that line? I say, what line? I say, what line? I say, Simon Peter, you belong with me. And that is what Jesus does for us. And not only does he re redefine that identity to say, you belong with me. And you're part of my league. <laughs> you do belong here. He also gives him a purpose. 
He redefines his purpose to say, you think that all you're good for is just catching fish day after day, but Simon Peter, I'm about to tell you, you're going to be part, just the way that I have crossed the line to welcome you in with me, that's what we're going to go do. You're going to be part of crossing the line for other people to welcome them in to say, you belong with me. We're going to go cat, we're going to be fishers of men, Simon Peter, and we're going to bring them in to God's family. Whoever, whoever. I love it. Jesus will cross the lines we, dis- we try to draw for ourselves. And he accepts us. Not only that, he defines us, he sets us, and he gives us purpose. The next person that Jesus touched was right after that. This man in verse chap- verse, uh, chapter 5, verse 12 of Luke said, he comes to Jesus and he, he's desperate. This man is desperate. He is in pain. He has an incurable skin disease called leprosy. It's contagious. He has been cast out of his family because he can't be close to them. He has been removed from society because he's dangerous around others. It has been years since this man has felt a physical touch. And he comes to Jesus desperate. This is his only hope. This is his only hope. This is his one shot to be welcomed home again. And he comes to Jesus and he gets down on his knees and he is begging. He says, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. If you're willing. If you're willing. And I love what Jesus says. I am willing. Isn't that just a picture of how this love is not just out of duty. It is out of a willing heart. That Jesus, he does not just speak a word. He crosses the line that society has drawn. Other people have said, you don't touch this man. And Jesus crosses the line in a physical way. He actually physically reaches out and touches him. And the man is made clean. He reaches out. That love that is in him is a physical response to reach out and to touch him. And I love that. Love crosses the lines that society has drawn, touching those that others ignore. Jesus says, I know the pain that you are in. I see what you've been through. I I know what it feels like to be rejected. I know what that is like. And I am willing to make you clean. And he is. It's a miracle. (laughs) It's a miracle. The next line is in Luke 5, 17, right after that. They are, Jesus goes and he's in a home and he's sitting around the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. And the home is crowded with people. Like at this point, everyone is hearing Jesus. And it is crowded. People are pushing in. And this, this story is about these four men and their friend. And these men, it says this. In verse 18, then behold, men brought on a bed a man who was paralyzed, whom they had sought to bring in and lay before him. These men go out and they find this man who has a disability. This man is paralyzed. He cannot stand on his own two feet. He cannot find his way to Jesus on his own. And these men specifically go out and find him. And they carry him on this bed. They carry him. Who knows the distance they've carried him. And they carry him to the house. And they get to the house and they're standing outside and it is crowded. And they have a choice right there. This traditional way of bringing someone in to see Jesus, the traditional line you might cross is that threshold through the door. But that's not an option for them today. And so they get creative. They decide we are not giving up. We are not going to give up. Love is going to cross this line. And they actually cross the roof line. (laughs) They go up the stairs of the side and they dig a hole in the side of, in the roof of this house. And they lower the man in to see Jesus. They will not give up on him. Their love has crossed the line. And they are an advocate for this man who cannot get to Jesus on his own. 
And that's what love does. Love crosses the line despite the obstacles and advocates for others who can't stand for themselves. Oh, this is a challenge to me. It is a big challenge to me to actively seek out those in need and to not give up when there's an obstacle. To find creative ways to introduce people to Jesus. To be a voice for those who can't speak and stand for those who can't stand for themselves. This is what I also love, is that Jesus did not ignore this man. Instead, he, it says this in verse 20. So it says in 19, and when they could not find how they might bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the housetop and let him down with his bed through the tiling into the midst before Jesus. And Jesus, verse 20, when he saw their faith, he said to him, the man, your sins are forgiven you. I hope and pray that I am found with faith in my heart that Jesus can honor. That he can say, I see your faith. And there's your miracle. That we would stand together and say, I have faith and I believe that if you have an encounter with Jesus, you're going to see a miracle. And I will not give up in my faith for you. And I will not give up as I, as I say, I know that the answer that you need is with Jesus. And I will find a way to get you there. I will, I will break down the roof of this house because I know what it will mean for you. Oh, that he would find us with that kind of faith that these friends had. That we would not give up, but that we would be part of that. That love that crosses the line. And you know what? People look at people with disabilities or, or special needs, whatever that is, and are often defined by their limitations. And the truth is... <laughs> We should be defined more by our potential and more by the gifts and abilities that God has given us than by our limitations. Because the truth is we are all marked by the same limitation and the greatest disability, which is selfishness. And I bump up against this. I don't know about you, but I'm just guessing. <laughs> We're the same. We bump up against this limitation every day with family, friends, work, with my children, <laughs> whatever it is. With my husband, the greatest limitation that I have in demonstrating love and reaching out is, oh, that's inconvenient. Or, oh, what's that going to require of me? And, oh, how, do my, how will I look? Oh, the number of times that I have felt prompted to reach out to someone in need and talk myself out of it. Because I've just not been sure. If th is that crossing the line? Yes, it's crossing the line. That's the point. <laughs> It's going to feel like crossing the line, but oh, that we would cross the line and say, it is not about me. Oh, Jesus, help us when we get stuck in our selfishness, our self-righteousness, like the Pharisees of the law who said, hey, you can't heal that man today. <laughs> you can't forgive his sins today. He said, well, it doesn't matter what day it is. <laughs> I'm going to cross that line. Because it's of the heart of God for people, the heart that he has for us that Jesus, oh, Jesus, transform us from the inside out. That we would be so less and less stuck in our selfishness and more and more free to reach out with your love. We all bump up against it and we all need the love of God to set us free. Right after that, this one is maybe one you know. Jesus meets up with a tax collector named Levi and says, follow me. And the tax collector left all, rose up and followed him. Then Levi gave him a great feast in his own house. And there were a great number of tax collectors and others who sat down with them. And the scribes and the Pharisees complained against his disciples saying, you cross in the line. You don't sit with those people. That whole group of them. Don't you know what they do? Stealing from people. Don't you know the sin they're living in? Jesus said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. And I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus crosses the line, and he is a friend of sinners. The people who think, the religious people think, you shouldn't sit with those people. And Jesus was welcome to their house. He didn't even push his way in. They're like, hey, Jesus, 
come hang out. We're going we're gonna to give a feast. I love that. They, he is invited to their house. He's invited to their table, and they know something about him that, hey, I think he's going to be okay with us. <laughs> And it's true, yeah, Jesus would be willing to cross the line he shouldn't cross. And he will sit with them, and he will eat with them. And they would have been invited at his table too, I'm sure. I recently was with my grandma, and I was just sharing with her, and she was just sharing stories from her history and her past about her parents. And she began to share about how her, uh, she just remembers her mom and dad especially her dad, just, they never knew who was coming home from, for dinner. They didn't know who was going to be around the table. And it could, could be anybody that night. And then who knows how long they would stay. Maybe they'd stay a few days. That's fine. And she began to share that. And I thought, that's what I think of her. And I was talking to my dad. He goes, that's how I remember it's his parents. That they, we used to live around the corner from, the, for the, from them. And as a kid, like, I would just walk over and not even knock. They wouldn't even know I was there for 20 minutes. I'm like in the kitchen making a sandwich. Oh, hey, yeah, the open door policy. Like, <laughs> come on in. Our house is always open. And that challenges me to the core because how much in our culture do we get kind of sucked into this, like, here's me and my family, and I've got to, like, if I'm going to invite people over, I better look nice. And listen, the toys are never going to be put away, <laughs> okay, at my house. This is, this is it. This is where we're at. And I just pray that our, our doors would be open, that our lives would be ready, that we would be ready for whatever is going to come, that that would mark us as believers. That's what marked Jesus, that he would cross the line, that he would invite people in, that whatever, whoever, whoever. I'm sure there were times with my grandparents that it was inconvenient and potentially even like, is this safe? Oh, well. We're inviting them in. And you know what? I look at them and I just think how awesome that their lives are bigger and bigger because of it. That they never caught, allowed hurt or pain or whatever to make them withdraw and shut down and fold their arms and go, whatever. Maybe it's not worth it to reach out. But instead, always motivated by God's love. That is his heart for us. That we be motivated by his love to not withdraw in our selfishness but that I would begin to be free to reach out, not so concerned with how I look and sound. I pray that my door is open for those who need a meal or a place to stay. And they have cool stories, too, of people who they invited in, an elderly woman who stayed a couple nights, and then when she left, they're like, it was like an angel. She gave them $20, which at that time would have gone a long way, for groceries or whatever. And my, my, gran my grandma just remembers, remembers thinking, wow, like we invited her in not expecting anything. And God totally blessed us through her. And then another woman who was a young mom, a teen mom who had been kicked out of her home, and they invited her in. And she stayed with them a while. And she got saved. And just somewhat recently, I think, her daughter came back to my grandparents and said, thank you for taking my mom in and just expressed that the testimony that she had given her heart to God too. How cool. I want to live like Jesus and demonstrate that love that crosses the line. Uh, a couple years ago, I had this nice yellow purse and I was out somewhere and I left it Thankfully, I had my phone with me, but it had my keys, I had my wallet, everything else was in this purse. A little yellow purse. And I left it somewhere, and they came back to get it, and it was gone. I was like, oh, no. Why did I put it there? Why did I set it down? I'm thinking all this through, like, it's, it's been stolen, basically. Someone took it. So we're asking around, has anyone seen my purse? You know, just in case somebody saw it, and I'm mistaken. No one's seen it. No one knows. And uh, I'm like, oh, my goodness, it's been stolen. So... They're like, okay, well, you should report it to the police just in case someone finds it. So I report it to the police. And then everyone around me is like, well, you know what happens often if someone steals something? They maybe just take the cash or whatever they want out of it. And then they dump the rest because they don't care about the rest. So they're like <laughs> searching through the dumpsters around where I am. They're like pulling things out, trying to find my purse. They're looking at the construction site across the way, doing all that they can to help me find it. And eventually we're like, no, it's gone. It's, that's it. That's the end of the purse. And so I, I didn't have a ride home. I had to figure out my way home because my keys were, had been in it. And 
So I'm like, oh, my gosh. I called the credit card company. Got to cancel my credit card. I think I've got it all sorted out. I get home. I, you know, time passes. I've given, like, it's done. It's been stolen. That's the end. So a couple weeks later, the police department calls me. And I should mention it's in Woodstock. So it's not like here. It's like far away. <laughs> and so they, they call me and they say, uh, is this Heidi? Yeah, this is Heidi. Uh, so um, <clears throat> we found your purse. Like, awesome. This is great. They found my purse. This is so good. Cool. Like, when can I come get it? Whatever. Like, well, so, um, but the bad news is we found it <laughs> in a porta potty. <laughs> and I'm like, oh. They're like, no, like, in the porta potty. <laughs> I'm like, awesome. That's great. That's really good. So I've got this visual image of my lovely yellow purse soaking in a porta potty for two weeks. So they go, so like, we do have it here. I mean, it has your keys in it, and, but, like, it's just in an evidence bag, like, sealed. We tried to clean it up. I'm like, okay. They go, so if you want it, like, we can just pitch it, but we just want to let you know it's here. I'm like, no, I'm going to come get it. <laughs> like, and you're the one on the other end, like, sorry, what? <laughs> like, no, I want it. I'll come get it. I'll come pick it up. I'm on my way. I'm going to come get this purse. <laughs> They're like, this girl's nuts. <laughs> like, she's not understanding the porta potty thing, but all right. So I, I I drive down to Woodstock, go in the police department. I'm like behind the plexiglass door wall, you know. Hi, I'm here for my purse, and I'm like, okay. So they go with some lockers, and I'm like waiting, and then they come and they bring this bag, this bag, and it's got my purse in it, and it's barely recognizable at this point. But they like <laughs> shove it under the glass, like here you go. <laughs> whatever. <laughs> and so I, I pick it up. I'm like, yes, <laughs> yes, this is so great. I got my purse back. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to take it home. It's got my shopper's optimum card. It's got a lot of points on there. Okay. <laughs> no, it mattered to me most of my keys. But anyways, I, I'm like, I'm not going to open it now. I'm going to wait till I get home and I'm going to like put big rubber gloves on and I'm, <laughs> I go home and I peel open the bag and I dump it out on the grass and I like, oh, that's disgusting. And I take all the cards and line them all up and I just soak it. I just spray it all down. Listen, my cards all still have a slight odor to them. <laughs> and also now there's an app for that. But anyways, <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I wanted it back. And I just felt like God was saying this week as I, he brought that story back to my rem- memory He was saying, I will come for you. In fact, I did. (laughs) I don't care the state you're in. It doesn't matter the stain of your sin. How long you've been gone. I will come for you. Because I want to bring you home. Because you're important to me. You're valuable. You are that valuable to me. I thought, oh, what a picture of the heart of God for us. That he would come for us. And we write ourselves off and we, we make, make all the reasons why we're not worthy. And the, reason, the truth is, we're not <laughs> on our own, but instead Jesus came and he demonstrated the heart of God to step into your pain with you, to step into the place where you are, to invite you to come as you are, to invite you to come as you are. And the beautiful thing about this is that in fact, Jesus crossed the greatest line of all. Because people had known to this point, and we know, we understand, going from life to death. We understand that death is inevitable, and that we're going to meet it. (laughs) But Jesus, and he, he went and he crossed that line. He died for us on the cross. But Jesus also did something that no one else could do. And he crossed a line that no one else could cross. And he crossed the line because he died on the cross and he went from death to life. And in that, he defeated 
death. He defeated the power of sin. He defeated all of that. And he doesn't just take his gloves and (laughs) dump us out and hose us down and hope for the best. Instead, there is no residue of that sin. That odor does not exist anymore because it says that he has made you new. He has made you new. And that is the power of this message. That is the good news about what Jesus has done. That he sees us where we are and he does not leave us there. Instead, he says, come and follow me because I have a purpose for you. I have a plan for you. I can tell you who you are. I can make you brand new. And this is the new line. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that, here's the line, whoever, whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. That is the promise that he gives to us, everlasting life. That line has been blurred (laughs) when we experience life to death, it's actually life to life because that line has been crossed out. That line has been crossed. That's the good news. Would you close your eyes for just a moment? Maybe you're sitting here today and you feel like that lost purse. Maybe you feel like the dirty, forgotten, been gone a long time. And I want you to know today, and God wants you to know that he is ready here today to welcome you home, just as you are. And I don't know where you've come from. I don't know the life that you've lived. But God knows, and he is reaching out to you today. He has crossed the line. And he is reaching out to you to say, come home. Come home. You belong with me. You belong with me. I have made a place for you. If that's you today and you've been waiting, you've been waiting for an opportunity to come home. You've been waiting for an opportunity to say, God, I want to give you my heart. You know that you need Jesus, but you've never had a chance to give your heart to him today. I'm going to give you that chance. I want to invite you just where you're seated to raise your hand and let me know that today you're gonna give your heart to God. Just raise your hand where you are. Just raise it up wherever you are. Thank you. Thank you for being bold. Thank you for allowing God to welcome you in. I'm just gonna give it another minute because I know that God is speaking. I know. Thank you. Is there anyone else? If you raise your hand and all of us together, let's pray this out loud. Because when the, the word says that when we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, that he is faithful to save us. So let's pray this together. You can repeat after me. Thank you, Jesus, for your love. I turn to you today. Thank you that you welcome me home. Thank you that you forgive me. Thank you that you give me a purpose. I give you my life today. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, the word says that when one sinner repents, there is a multitude of angels in heaven who are rejoicing, and we're going to join them. so excited for you. If you raised your hand today, I'm just going to invite you to stay where you are after the service. There's a couple of people who love to say hello. And I want to encourage you in your walk with God as you start in this journey. It is, it's, I believe that it is going to change your life. All your troubles may not just go away, but he's going to be with you in every single thing that you face. And I want to encourage you to get plugged in and continue. Join the body. Join in with the people who are here. We are your family, and we are here for you. We're excited for you and all that God's doing in your life. Church, let's stand together.
And as we sing this song once again about how our chains are gone, let it remind us about the lines that Jesus has crossed. Amen? Let's go. Chains are gone. I've been set free. God, my Savior has ransomed. church as we go out this week I pray that we would be transformed from the inside out that we would be less held back by ourselves and more willing to reach even across these lines whatever it is we're gonna who we're gonna talk to out there let's have eyes to see the ones that we can reach out to as we go this week and believe that God is going to do amazing things when we begin to reach out amen amen we love you you're dismissed have a great week